All right. Good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, today we have a very interesting lecture by Professor Wen Chao Li, who's an assistant professor from um, Boston University. He's from the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, and he directs a very interesting lab on dependable computing uh, lab at uh, Boston University. And uh, so prior to joining Boston University, he was a computer scientist at the Stanford Research Institute, SRI International in Menlo Park, California. And he received his PhD uh, from, uh, Cal from Berkeley. And so Venchar's research is very exciting. It's at this intersection of formal methods, machine learning, quite a lot of the work uh, that we are very excited about at Penn too. And, uh, in, and his focus is on building safe and trustworthy autonomous systems. And today he's going to talk to us about, you know, how do we ensure that, you know, we have fleets of these autonomous uh, AI uh, uh, controlled uh, autonomous robots and how do we ensure that they operate in a safe and efficient manner. So welcome, uh, Vencha, we're very excited to hear you today. And uh, there's uh, uh, quite an audience over here and so I'm sure we'll have a lot of good questions along the way too. That, that's great. So thank you very much, uh, Raku, for the very kind introduction. Um, so, so today I'll talk about uh, uh, Byzantine resilience in large uh, robot swarms. Um, and I, I realized that um, uh, when I say large, that can mean so different things to different people. Um, are we talking about tens of robots? Are we talking about hundreds of robots? So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to put, um, I'm gonna, going to put a number on these. Um, so we are going to talk about achieving Byzantine resilience in swarms with thousands of robots. Um, so robots are pretty cool, uh, but if we can put a group of them together and if they work together, uh, we can do really amazing things. Um, so here are some of the application areas that uh, robot swarms uh, have transformed or have the potential to transform. Right, um, so Amazon, Amazon Robotics, right, this warehouse automation application is a canonical uh, example of uh, de the deployment of large, uh, you know, uh, scaled cooperative robots. Um, also, uh, robot swarms have applications on surveillance and maintenance of critical infrastructures, uh, has a lot of applications um, on precision agriculture as well. Um, uh, and we can also apply it uh, for entertainment. Um, so here's a, uh, a, a short video clip uh, showing uh, sort of drone sewing formations uh, in a Christmas show uh, uh, in Sydney. Um, so, so there are really um, you know, many, many applications, exciting applications that uh, uh, robot swarms can, can unlock, um, but because they are also cyber physical uh, systems, right? So they're subject to both physical failures, physical attacks, as well as cyber attacks. So here's uh, some figures from this paper showing sort of the variety of ways that uh, these uh, robots can, can, can fail or can be attacked, right? Including, including things such as actuator and sensor failures, uh, denial of service attacks, uh, networking faults. And, um, and sometimes because we have a group of robots some of the robots might be compromised by an outside attacker, and they would try to perhaps exert some influence over the whole group with some malicious intent. So on one hand, robot swarms have many exciting applications, right? In a, such as shape formation, search and rescue, surveillance and reconnaissance, uh, cooperative target tracking and monitoring, you know, collective transport and so on. And on the other, they face security and reliability challenges. And in fact, even a few faulty or malicious robots can easily disrupt the function and the overall safety of the swarm. So given the multitude of ways that these you know, robots can fail um, or can be attacked, um, it's important to understand um, their resilience from Byzantine attackers. So we are going to consider a very strong uh, form of attack called Byzantine attacks, which means that there is an unknown subset of robots in the group, and they're allowed to have arbitrarily different behaviors relative to the cooperative robots in terms of their motions and in terms of uh, communication. So the message that they, they transmit to the group. 
Um, so we are going to consider a decentralized setting. Um, and, and this includes having a unstructured environment. So this is different from a, the warehouse setting. And we have decentralized control, um, which means that there is no centralized controller that controls the motions or actions of the robots. Each robot has its own controller. And we have local communication, which means that each robot can communicate to some other robots up to some radius. And we assume that they also are equipped with some onboard sensors that can make observations in a small physical neighborhood. Um, and since these are robots, um, they, um, yeah, the robots uh, also move around. So in terms of the connectivity or the network topology that connects these robots, that changes over time as well. So we are going to consider these attacker model uh, called Byzantine attacks. Um, again, uh, we have, let's say, a fixed group of robots. So we are not going to add or remove robots during the executions. And we assume that some of them are Byzantine. Again, Byzantine means that they can they are allowed to have arbitrarily different behaviors relative to the cooperative robots. Um, we assume that the robots have, have identities issued by some trusty authority at deployment time. So, which means that um, um, when they exchange messages, the messages are signed by these identities. So there's no way for them to, to forge uh, fake identities. So we are, these attacker models exclude uh, uh, specifically civil attacks. Um, and for the attackers uh, of the, or the Byzantine robots, their goal is to disrupt the, the application or disrupt the function of the application. So this is application specific as, as I showed uh, um, in, in this presentation. So we are talking about um, uh, multi-robot systems and multi-robot systems are also distributed systems. And the central problem in distributed system is consensus. And the typical way of implementing consensus is using what is called the linear consensus protocol. So here's X, which is the value of X is what the robots want to achieve consensus on. For instance, this could be the location of a moving target. And each robot I can make its own observation XI, and then it's going to send its observations to the neighbors and in turn also update its own value via a convex subcombination of the received values. Okay, so here the NIs are the neighbors that uh, robot I has connectivity to, um, and the WI and WJs are the weights. So we are doing essentially a weighted sum of these. Um, and here's uh, some figures uh, and examples of doing uh, flocking a uh, control of multi uh, agent systems, and the consensus is on the heading angle. Okay, so the robots want to reach a consensus on where the direction to go. And you can see that using linear consensus uh, 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 protocol, uh, the robots sort of quickly agree on the heading. So LCP works pretty well in a perfect scenario where there are no faulty or malicious robots. But even if there are a few robots, in fact, even there's even there's one Byzantine robot, it can actually uh, disrupt uh, LCP. So here's an example of uh, doing target tracking. So the Byzantine robots uh, with this red circle on the top um, are uh, trying to uh, transmit false information about where the target is. Uh, to the rest of the robots. Uh, the targets of move and has this green circle on top and the rest of the blue uh, robots are cooperative robots. So here, it's, this is the swarm in action. So the Byzantine robots is basically telling the other robots that the target is sort of, you know, outside this map area and quickly is able to fool these cooperative robots into going to those places instead of actually following the target. Um, so this is pretty bad, right? So imagine this is, uh, you know, in a scenario where it's, um, the target has a lot of values and none of the cooperative robot would be able to track or monitor this target. So the state of the art uh, methods of mitigating uh, Byzantine attacks 
uh, on uh, essentially applications built over uh, the linear consensus protocol is uh, is called uh, the weighted mean is called WMSR, so it stands for weighted mean subsequence reduce. Um, and the key idea of WMSR is very simple. Uh, we are going to filter out the outliers um, in the receive values. So it assumes that there are up to F Byzantine robots in the group. And all we need to do is throw out the highest F and the lowest F values. And then the rest is the same as linear consensus. Uh, and because we are throwing out essentially two F outliers, the network needs to be two F plus one connected. Otherwise it's not going to update its value. So by two F connected uh, plus one connected, I mean that each robot has to be connected to at least two F plus one robots, other robots. And if this condition is satisfied, then for a fixed X, we can show that eventually the group of robots will reach consensus uh, on X, okay? Um, so here's, uh, in fact, uh, some papers from PAND, right, showing uh, the application of WMSR on resilient flocking of, uh, 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 several, uh, 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 of several robots. So WMSR works quite well right, in those settings, but there are also a lot of limitations. First of all, we need to know F. So we need to make an assumption on the number of Byzantine robots in the group, but we don't really know that, right? There's no way to know how many attackers are there. And as the swarm size increases, really the connectivity stays at roughly the same. So each robot is still connected to roughly the same number of robots. So these 2F plus one requirements, connectivity requirements becomes the bottleneck to scalability. And because we need to assume F to be known, WMSR does not adapt to situations where there are actually less than F attackers. So in other words, we assume there are F attackers, but what if there's actually no attacker? So here I'm gonna show you a video of the same, uh, of a robot swarm. So these are tiny turtle bots that are moving around in a, some collision free way. And there's no Byzantine robots here, but we have to make some assumption on F. And what happens is that because the network can, can the actual network connectivity does not satisfy these 2F plus one requirements, then most of the robots receive no new values. Okay, they just stay put. And only the robots that are able to directly observe the target will be able to track the target. So we can see that essentially the overall functionality of the swarm fails. And lastly, uh, a very um, a, a limitation of WMSR is that it's only applicable to swarm applications that are built based on or built over the linear consensus protocol. And there are many other applications that are not based on linear consensus. So how do we tackle those things? So the new method that we have come up with is called a decentralized block list protocol. And they're basically based on two key ideas. The first one, is observing that WMSR is actually quite passive. It's just throwing out some outliers. Can we instead actively seek out the Byzantine robots? And if we are able to do that, then maybe we can just ignore whatever things that they say. And the second idea is that because these are also robotic systems that are subject to certain physical constraints, so maybe we can leverage those physical constraints to help determine if the information that a robot receives is actually false. So the, the, the components in these protocols uh, are follows. We allow the robots to actually accuse each other and propagate the accusations. Each robot maintains a list of accusations that it has generated or received. And based on the accusation list, the robots with this, with, in a decentralized manner, determine which robots to block, essentially uh, ignoring the messages they are sent from those robots um, um, and, 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 and only using um, messages that are not uh, from the non-block robots. 
Um, so this is a fairly recent work that with appears at uh, AAMAS uh, this year. So how does accusations work? We say accused ACCIJ uh, to mean that I robot I accuses robot J. Um, here, because the robots uh, have identities given by trusted authority, these accusations are also signed by uh, their identities. So when you receive an accusation, is to, you, can, you, can, you can verify that the accusations is actually coming from I and is accusing J. Okay, so some other robot K may receive that accusation. The cooperative robots, they would always flood the accusations if he hasn't seen one before. And each robot maintains its own list of received accusations. So for these to work, the accusations need to be sound. In other words, if I accuses J, then one of them must be an uh, and uh, a Byzantine robot. We cannot have the case where a cooperative robot accuses another cooperative robot. Right. But here, know that the Byzantine robots can also accuse cooperative robots. So we don't know which I, uh, we don't know whether I or J is actually the bad guy. And, and they can, in fact, even accuse themselves if they want to. Right. So the challenge is to figure out from these, all these accusations that are flying around, who are really the bad guys? Who are really the Byzantine robots? So here's an overview of an, of an example illustrating how the decentralized block list protocol will work. So again, we're looking at a target tracking applications. So the, red, uh, the black star here is the target. And we have two Byzantine robots in red and they would uh, transmit false observations. So basically the red stars are the false locations of the target. And one and six will tell their neighbors that the, the target is actually at those uh, locations. Um, and here only three is able, robot three is able to make a direct observations of the black star. And the rest of the robots have to rely on informations that are being transmitted to them to, to know where the target is. So here, um, zero can actually see where the red star, uh, the location of the red star, and it sees that, well, this target is actually not there. So it, zero accuses one. And similarly, robot five can see where the second red star at the bottom is, and it sees that, well, the, the target is not there. So it's going to accuse six, because six is saying that that's where the target is. Um, and the false target information also propagate through the network to robot three. And because three knows where the real target is, it would also accuse the originators of those messages, which are robot one and robot six. So we have these accusations. And we can sort of visualize accusations in a graph, right? Where the nodes are the robots and the edges correspond to the accusations. And the way that it works, we are going to solve a problem on these graph structures to figure out who the Byzantine robots are. And that's the main idea. Any questions so far? Okay, let me move on. So here's how it works. The accusation graph actually have a special structure. It's it's semi bipartite. So hopefully we are all we have familiar. A couple of questions. Uh, which... Oh sure. Um, I was wondering what causes the Byzantine robots. Uh, like where do they come from? Is it like just kind of like an error or something? Yeah. So we make no assumptions on how they fail or how they're compromised. All we are saying is that they're allowed to have any other behaviors, arbitrarily different behavior, behaviors relative to the cooperative robots. So they may fail, uh, they may transmit false information, they may stop to propagate information from other robots, um, they may move in their own way. Um, we make no assumptions of what they can do. Yeah, but Thank it you. could be due to physical failures of sensors, 
uh, but it could be also due to external attacks that come from, though there's an attacker that have compromised the robot and decide to kind of uh, subvert the whole uh, operation of the group and say that, well, that's where the target is, but actually the target, the real target is somewhere else. Yeah. So the, the message here is that Byzantine attack is a very strong form of attack because we are not assuming the actual behaviors of the attack. Hi, I was wondering if you could clarify um, how you determine which nodes or, or robots are able to directly observe any like given stars like based on proximity or something? Yeah, yeah. So we assume that the robots can make local observations. So this is just an example showing that uh, only robot three can make a direct observations of the target, which is this black star. And all the other robots will have to rely on information being transmitted to them to know where the target is. So this is typically how uh, target tracking works in a swarm, right? So only a few robots can actually see the target. And then when they see the target, they tell the other robots, you know, well, that's the location of the target. And obviously, if the, rope, the swarm is very large, it takes time for that information to also propagate to the, to the whole swarm. Hi, Professor Lee. Um, for this specific seven robot um, DBP experiment, was there a certain threshold of Byzantine robots where the entire system just completely failed? Ah, so that's a great question. So this is a simple example. Again, so I'm going to show you examples where we have a thousand robots. Um, and in general, uh, I'm, I'm actually going to, so hopefully this will become clear in a few slides. Um, there's obviously some conditions under which um, the cooperative uh, robots will, uh, will be able to continue to function. Um, but we don't have sort of the classic notions of these only works if, uh, uh, if the attackers is a minority of the group, okay? Um, I'll, I'll talk about this in a few slides. So hopefully they will become clear in, in, in a minute or two. Thank you. And uh, can, <clears throat> excuse me, can uh, the bad guys collude? Yes, they can collude. They can work together. They can do anything. Yes, they can collude. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So they're not independently compromised. Yeah, they can work together. Yeah, they are Byzantine robots. Yeah. So this is typically the strongest form of attacks that you can uh, you can imagine, uh, with the exclusion of civil attacks. Yeah. Uh, and the communication is kind of multicast. So can can they tell different things to different neighbors? Yes, they can tell different things to different neighbors. Um, yeah, that that's also allowed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We we don't control what they can do. Other than that, they, they don't they cannot forge new identities, fake identities of robots. So they don't create fake robots in the group. Other than that, they can they're allowed to do anything. Um, uh, uh, one more, I mean, technical constraints which will hopefully become obvious. Obviously, these robots cannot. Uh, well, there there are physical constraints, right? They, they cannot all of a sudden like move at the speed of light. Um, but they're essentially subject to the same physical constraints that the other robots have. But other than that, they can collude, they can tell different things to different robots. Um, they can even don't tell anything, right? They receive some piece of information, but then they don't transmit. Um, they can do all those things. Yeah. One quick question. Um, when the robots communicate, is it always um, to their direct neighbors or um, not not at the DBP level, but at the application level, will ah. um, will there ever be uh, data flows that involve, say, a chain of five robots or something like that? Uh, yes, yes. Actually, I should have clarified. So at the application level, uh, the communication is achieved through flooding. Um, so each robot is essentially broadcast uh, uh, to their uh, or multicast to their to their neighbors. So it's often possible that it takes multiple hops for the for a message to reach uh, some other robot. Thanks. Okay, so let me move on. So 
here's the essentially the 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 main technical slide on how this works. Um, so after we enable accusations and each of the nodes maintains um, and a list of accusations, uh, we would observe that the accusations list forms a graph. And this graph has a special structure, is semi-bipartite. And you can see that, so semi-bipartite essentially means that we still have these two partition of vertices in the graph. Um, but one of the partition can have edges within that partition. So this is slightly different from uh, a normal bipartite graph where you only have edge between two partitions. Here is semi-bipartite. So one of the partition uh, is allowed to have also edges uh, in that partition. Um, so it turns out that um, we can have a, uh, conditions on semi-bipartite graph called the Hall marriage conditions. And some of you might be already familiar with the marriage conditions. It basically says that um, if these for a essentially a C or X semi-bipartite graph, so C here is, corresponds to the set of cooperative robots. So for a C semi-bipartite graph, and you can see that there are no edges between Cs, right? Between the uh, members of C. So the cooperative robot don't, get, uh, don't accuse cooperative robots. And for this type of graph, a C bar perfect matching exists. So a perfect, um, so I should talk, give a little bit background about matching. So given a directed graph, a matching is essentially a set, with, a set of pairwise uh, non-adjacent edges. And this matching is maximum, uh, or a matching is maximum if every edge has a non-empty intersections, right, with the matching, with the match for, uh, edges. Um, and uh, a, a matching is X perfect if it matches all the vertices in some set X, okay? And in this case, yours X corresponds to the set of uh, Byzantine uh, robots. So if this whole marriage condition satisfies, then a C bar perfect matching would exist in this particular graph. And we can use any algorithm to compute a maximum matching to find out where, uh, who the Byzantine robots are because any maximum matching would also be C bar perfect. So in other words, when, we, when the accusations have reached when we have enough accusations and the accusations have reached all the nodes in the swarm, then every robot, cooperative robot, will be able to figure out uh, who the Byzantine robots are um, by themselves. Of course, there are some costs associated with these because in general, uh, you still don't know when A accuses B, whether A is bad or B is bad, so we are um, also kind of, you know, some of the cooperative robots would also take the fall uh, for blocking the uh, non-cooperative robots. So here you can see that these uh, color pairs, they are essentially the robots that will be blocked, okay? And the color edges correspond to a maximum matching uh, of the semi-bipartite graph. Um, and also this problem of computing a maximum matching can be done fairly efficiently and there are algorithms that can solve these in big of square, square root VE time. Any questions on, on this? So the takeaway message here is that these accusation graphs have a special structure. There are conditions under which we can compute the maximum matching to figure out who the bad guys are. So let's look at some of these applications that we've been talking about. So target tracking, uh, I've shown a video before, um, and we have to design this accusation rule. So when does a robot know that uh, the information that it received from some other robots is actually bad or is actually false? So this is application dependent and you can design your own applications. And in fact, I'll talk about this a little bit in the, in the future work slide. But here are the accusation rules that we use in this particular example. So let's say delta p is the distance from uh, its own itself to the observations. Delta t is the elapsed time from the observations. C is the so-called speed of network flood, right? So this is not speed of light, but the time it takes to so how fast information can propagate through the network. R is some physical observation range. 
And these, the maximum rate of change of X in these cases is essentially how fast the, the target can move. So assuming that some of these are known parameters, right, in the, in the whole swarm system, then you can design these uh, accusation rules. So for instance, um, um, you can have a rule that essentially corresponds to the speed of flood, right? So uh, if I says a gets a message and, um, and essentially um, the it, it's moving, right, at, uh, uh, um, at uh, it has a, a, a moving at a distance that is actually greater than uh, 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 how fast uh, this, that information can propagate to the network that is, you know, something uh, fishy. Uh, uh, for instance, let's say this is my observation radius, but there's really no way um, uh, for the robot to, uh, to actually go there or there's, or, or dually, if there's no way for the, if I make an observations, uh, but then there's no way for the robot uh, to be there. So this really corresponds to the physical limitations of the, of the robots. And we use those to design these accusation rules. And every robot, uh, robot knows these accusation rules. Um, the, the details really here is not that important. Again, the, the takeaway message here is that, you know, there are physical constraints on how fast information can propagate, how fast the, the robots can move and so on, and how uh, and the observation radius of the robot, and you can use those parameters to design accusation rules to figure out when you uh, receive a message saying that I mix an observation, whether that's physically possible. That's all I, uh, that's all I say. Yeah. If it's physically impossible, then you make an accusation. Okay, so let me show you a demo comparing uh, WMSR, which was the prior state of the art uh, on, on achieving Byzantine resilience uh, versus uh, our approach, which is called DBP. So again, WMSR needs to know F. So this is the parameter F is set a priori and the network has to be two F plus one connected. Okay, so the red dots here are the Byzantine robots and uh, they're telling, um, And they're telling uh, the cooperative robots that uh, the, the target location is sort of somewhere else. Um, and uh, because WMSR is implemented, so the cooperative robots will essentially both throw out the, uh, the 2F outliers. And if F is high, then they just throw out all the information that you receive. In this case, you see that um, essentially the cooperative robots don't do anything unless they can directly observe the target, yeah. So in comparisons, um, this is how it, uh, it would work with DBP. So at the beginning, um, um, the cooperative robots will still receive false information from the Byzantine robots, but very quickly as the accusations propagate through the network, Right, they compute this maximum matching whenever they receive a new accusations, and then they will figure out these are the Byzantine robots. They will ignore messages from them and also do not propagate messages from those robots. And you can see that the swarm will continue to function. So in fact, all the cooperative robots in this case knows exactly where the target is. Any questions on, uh, on the animations? It seems like in the DBP case, you have a higher degree in your network. They, they are much more clustered together. Is, is that ah. uh, necessary or is that just... just uh, no, so at the beginning, it's exactly the same. Um, they are clustered together uh, because they uh, know where the target is. So they move towards the target. So that's okay. why they got closer. Okay, good. So, so the network connectivity is, you know, for both cases is at the beginning is exactly the same throughout is roughly the same. Yeah. And obviously if they get closer, you'd, uh, uh, you, you know, you connect to more robots, uh, but the network topology in general can, uh, can be time varying. Um, yeah. So we, we proved that this would, uh, would work. Um, and under, um, and I think fairly general technical, uh, under fairly general technical conditions. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, I mean, this is we are we are not showing um, a thousand robots here. So this is just you know, um, you know, twenty thirty robots with a few Byzantine robots. Um, but let me also show you uh, sort of a different visualization of actually what's happening. Um, so the y-axis corresponds to essentially um, errors uh, with respect to the actual location of the target. So the black line is the um, the x coordinate uh, of the target of x. The blue stuff are the errors. Um, so the errors from uh, 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 from the cooperative robots. And uh, these are actually looking at a larger scenario where there are 20, uh, 200 cooperative robots and, and 100 uh, Byzantine robots. Uh, uh, and, and, and we are even assuming that WMSR knows exactly how many Byzantine robots are there. So it sets up to 100. Okay. So it does not, does not overestimate the number of Byzantine robots. And you can see that's the errors kind of, you know, they would stay roughly the same throughout uh, the, the, the task as the, as the targets of move around in its environment. Um, and if we, if they underestimate uh, the number of Byzantine robots, which is in the, in the bottom uh, left figure, then again, you have a larger spread of the errors because you're not throwing out uh, uh, the, uh, false information, um, and so that would uh, would be very problematic. Uh, for DBP, you see that initially the cooperative robots would still have errors on where the target is, and you see these. Uh, the second plot is actually showing the uh, the minimum block size amount, the block list size amount, all the block lists that are being maintained uh, by the cooperative robots. So uh, because we have a finite number of uh, robots. So at some time, all the accusations are going to reach the, um, all the robots, and then they are all going to agree, essentially reach a consensus on who the bad guys are. And at that point, they are going to block the transmissions uh, from all the bad guys, and they, would, uh, uh, they, and, and they would know exactly where the target is. So after a while, you see that there's no tracking error in this um, experiment. Uh, if we use uh, DBP. Again, I want to emphasize here is that uh, 2F plus 1 connect is actually a requirement for WMSR to work for us. It's just a, actually just a sufficient condition. It's not a necessary condition. The necessary condition is really that the accusations have to be propagated uh, throughout through, through the network. So it has to be reached to all. An accusation needs to be able to reach to every cooperative robot um, in the swarm. Um, and F plus one connected is really the worst case. So this is a guarantee uh, uh, even for the worst case. But in practice, um, you might have lower network connectivity, but it, was, you, it may still work uh, very well. So here's uh, uh, an example demo really want showing that uh, DBP scales tools uh, to swarm with uh, hundreds and thousands of robots. So here is an example with many cooperative robots and I think 200 uh, 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 Byzantine robots um, and they're doing arbitrarily different things. Uh, they're telling uh, the cooperative robots, uh, their uh, different uh, false locations of the target. Some of them would decide not to transmit uh, uh, useful information. So they're doing many different things. And the green dot, which is the target, uh, which you hopefully can see, is sort of slowly moving from uh, uh, the top right to the bottom left and then up and so on. And then you'll see that uh, the, um, the, um, uh, you'll see that the, the blue robots would be, actually would still be able to track the target uh, despite having 200 Byzantine robots in the swarm. So I think there's a question in chat and the question is that the minimum block list size is over twice the population of the Byzantine robot. Ah, 
so uh, um, so if you remember in the previous slide, uh, some of the cooperative robots have to take the fall, right? Uh, for blocking the Byzantine robots, because the essentially the maximum matching would cover not only the Byzantine robots, but also the same number of cooperative robots. So that's why the the size of the block list um, on this slide uh, is exactly twice the number of Byzantine robots. But the nice thing here is that we are guaranteed that all the Byzantine robots are blocked. So hopefully I, I answered that, uh, that question. Um, so again, this is an example showing that DBP scales to very large swarms. Um, and we choose this uh, really a thousand robot just because uh, this is kind of the maximum number that uh, which shows still nicely on the slide. Um, um, you can do this for you know, 10,000 robots, uh, it, it will work. Uh, we also look at uh, other applications. Uh, so here's it's an applications on doing uh, distributed time synchronizations. Uh, so the objective of the robot is to cooperate if synchronize their local clocks to some universal reference clock while moving through the environment. Um, we designate a sub so a subset of the robots are anchors, uh, which means that they can actually make high precision observations of the reference clock. And then they would exchange uh, their observations with their neighbors uh, as they move around. Um, and then hopefully at the end of the day, the, all the swarm would get synchronized to this uh, uh, global reference clock. Um, so here we design an accusation rule that says if an anchor can accuse the originators of the message, if the observed times or whatever that or, origins, uh, or, uh, origins of the message says is actually larger than whatever the anchor can observe. Okay, so that's not possible because the anchors uh, it's assumed to be able to make high precisions of the reference local times, and then it takes time for a message to propagate. So it cannot be larger than that. Um, so here with DB, uh, DBP, we run this on um, uh, an example of about 100 plus uh, robots, uh, 100 of them are cooperative, uh, some number of them are anchors, and then uh, plus uh, 45 Byzantines. So these are fairly arbitrary numbers that we pick uh, for this particular example. And again, you see the same uh, trend. Uh, we started out having errors on time synchronizations across the group, uh, across the swarms. And as the, um, uh, the, the robots compute these maximum matchings individually and figure out what robots to block, and then at some point it's able to block all the Byzantine robots, and then they're able to synchronize to the, to the essentially the observations that are transmitted by the anchors. So this is still uh, LCP, so Linear Consensus Protocol Base. Uh, here's another application that is actually not uh, implemented uh, over LCP. Uh, this is doing cooperative localization. So the robots here move in some unknown environment uh, and they use the inter-robot distance measurements to estimate their position within a global coordinate system. Uh, and again, some of the robots are anchors, which means that, for instance, they have GPS equipped or some other stuff equipped. Uh, localization systems equip, and they're able to make very high precision observations of their own positions. Um, so here's informally, so we can also design a set of accusation rules based on essentially physical impossibilities. And here we see that uh, once the um, uh, the robots figure out uh, uh, whom to block, then uh, the uh, localization error uh, goes down uh, uh, to, to close to zero. Um, so just to, uh, uh, to summarize uh, what I've shown so far, uh, so I've presented really, I think, the new state-of-the-art protocol for doing uh, Byzantine resilience in robot swarms. It's called Decentralized Block List. Um, there are a few, I think, nice features that comes with uh, DBP compared to prior art. We don't need to know how many Byzantine robots are there a priori. Um, it's adaptive in the sense that um, we automatically figure out uh, the uh, whom to block, and we are guarantee that if the accusations would, uh, are successfully flooded through the network, then we would block all the Byzantine robots. So it's, it's, it, it adapts automatically to the number of Byzantine robots. Uh, it also requires 
has a smaller requirement compared in terms of network con uh, connectivity compared to WMSR, uh, which is actually very important as we scale the size of the swarm, because again, network connectivity remains roughly the same. Uh, if you increase, uh, because that's based on the radial or the strength of the radial and and uh, going from 10 robots to 1,000 robots, the connectivity is not going to change much. Um, and also, it can handle applications that are uh, that are not implemented on linear uh, consensus protocol. Uh, so we've also relieved, uh, released the code uh, implementation for this protocol on GitHub. Uh, you're welcome to check it out. Um, and uh, obviously, this is, uh, again, I would say it's an initial important step towards achieving uh, Byzantine resilience in large robot swarms. Um, and uh, we, we imagine there are also uh, a number of future steps that we can take to further improve this work. Uh, the first one is maybe we can automatically synthesize uh, sound accusation rules. Here, the accusation rules are designed by, by us based on what we know about the applications. But maybe there's a way to automatically synthesize them uh, from uh, constraints or from specifications of the system. Um, uh, we also want to be able to, in practice, tolerate uh, unsung accusations. For instance, um, the robot might actually be cooperative, but then because of a, a transient, maybe sensor failures, uh, it makes the wrong observation. Right, because sensors are not perfect, and it could end up making actually false accusations. And we want we want to be able to tolerate those. Uh, we also have some ideas on how to actually um, address those situations. Uh, last but not least, um, if we have these accusation mechanisms implemented, then maybe we can do accusation aware controller designed, which means the controllers, knowing that it needs accusations for the swarm to be resilient to Byzantine attackers, it would actually try to find ways to actively find ways to make accusations. Okay, so not just controlling, uh, generating control outputs that are useful for the task, but hopefully also useful for Byzantine resilience. So that's uh, the conclusions and, uh, and future work uh, for, uh, for DBP. Uh, uh, and I have some more slides that I want to talk about in terms of uh, on, on related work, uh, but on a slightly different topic, uh, but I can also answer questions on, on DPP now uh, before I move on. Um, I have a question uh, about, so are, are accusations persistent? Persistent meaning that, ah, Yes, actually, that's a great question. I think it's related to the second bullet in the future step. So if I accuses J, then, uh, then um, you cannot unaccuse someone, someone. So the accusations of I accuses J would reach uh, uh, everybody in the network, uh, all the, at least the, all the cooperative robots in the network. And you cannot unaccuse someone, unaccuse someone. So that's actually something that we want to address. But if you do that, uh, doesn't that open the door for the attackers to kind of um, utilize that and uh, so, perpetually kind of hang the network in the state of uh, in the transient state? Yeah, yeah. So that's a very good question. So we are not actually. So what we have in mind is not to allow uh, someone to unaccuse someone else. Okay. So we're not trying to undo the accusations, but uh, we are. The ideas that we have is try to think of uh, essentially doing something very similar to an exponential backoff. So if you uh, you know if you see one accusations and you have some penalty, you will block it for some time, um, and then you can have a. Um, but if you receive multiple accusations of for this on the same robots, then that robots would be stuff uh, block for exponentially increasing period of time. So if it, it behaves badly, then it's basically blocked indefinitely. Um, so we have some ideas, obviously those are future steps. Right now we require that the uh, accusations to be sound. Uh, and as long as they're sound, this, this will work. Um, but we just want to tolerate situations where even the good robot sometimes can make mistakes. And we just want to make sure that we we tolerate those in some graceful manner. Yeah. Uh, I have a question that uh, suppose in an extreme case that uh, there is a dangerous 
thing that only two robots are able to observe that and one reports this is dangerous one report this is safe so is your model able to solve this scenario because i assume like both of them will be blocked is it yeah yeah so if you're looking at uh just two robots right and uh one rob if both of them can observe that then the good robot is not going to uh it's just basically going to ignore whatever the bad robot says right so it's just going to uh, continue to if it's target tracking is able to track it the situations that is a bit different is all if if only the bad robot can observe the target right and the good robot has to rely on information from the, the bad robot and then obviously it will be fooled because unless it has a way to accuse it so knows that it's not possible for the target to be there but in that situation it also doesn't know where the target is uh, so in fact here's um uh there's also for uh, in terms of information propagation or in terms of information update, uh, you would also need uh, at least one cooperative observer on the actual value of X, so on the target of X. Yeah, but actually in, uh, in WMSR, that requirement is also 2F plus 1. So we are able to reduce the requirements in, for information propagation from 2F plus 1 to just 1, to one cooperative robot. Okay. Yeah. Uh, second question is that do you have to like implicitly implicitly assume that the faulty robots are the minority otherwise no nope. okay. uh, we don't have to assume that yeah we don't have to assume that the faulty robots are minority uh but do know that uh the the, the if if in the worst case we require f plus one connectivity uh, that it means that essentially means uh, F is very large, right, in that case, and that means uh, a good robot has to be connected to many robots for this to work. Yeah. Okay. Thank and you. Quick yeah. follow on from that. Uh, even if it's not a minority, is there still some upper bound on what F can be given an arbitrary sized um, robot flock? Yeah, so the requirements are only on uh, network connectivity, or actually, this is a sufficient condition. So the the real requirements on floodabilities, so the, whether the accusations would reach the, uh, all the cooperative uh, robots in the network, um, and having at least one cooperative robot that observe the true value of X, um, and obviously. Um, Uh, yeah, so I, I don't think there's, and, and as long as those conditions are satisfied, they should work. Uh, so imagine, I guess the, maybe the technical um, technicality that you're thinking about is because it looks like we have to double the number of robots to block, right? Because of doing maximum matching. Um, but, um, uh, and, and so, um, yeah, so it's, um, yeah, so it's possible that I don't uh, know this on top of my head and I don't want to say maybe one way or the other, but, uh, but okay, so I can put a very strong statement saying that if, if the Byzantine robot is a minority, so less than 50%, this would work for sure. Um, and I think this would still work uh, if there are more than 50%. But actually, at this point, this becomes really a theoretical analysis, because if an attacker can compromise, you know, 50 out of 100 robots or like 70 out of 100 robots, may as well compromise the whole host wall. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we don't have much time. I have some more slides I want to talk about so I just want to uh, talk about some related endeavors in my groups uh, on the topic of uh, building safe and trusty trustworthy autonomous systems uh, so I'm showing some uh, works uh, belong to different categories we've done work on safety verification of neural network control systems uh, doing robust uh, and safe learning machine learning doing neural network repair 
Um, and so at the top, these are essentially new algorithms that can verify or uh, achieve or enhance uh, robustness, safety, or securities of autonomous systems. And at the bottom, I want to make sure that uh, when I deploy these algorithms on real systems, they can still work reliably despite uncertainties in the actual environments. Uh, so at the bottom, these are more system level uh, techniques. So what I've uh, talked about today is really the uh, a recent work that, that's on securing, uh, securing multi-robot systems. Um, and I want to quickly maybe spend a few minutes on uh, sort of the other works that focus on uh, verifying or enhancing robustness of AI or AI enabled systems. And there are many different notions of robustness when we talk about these types of things. Um, some of the well-known notions are, are uh, robustness uh, with respect to adversarial perturbations, but uh, we also have other types of robustness, right? Robustness to distributional shift, uh, the controllers, uh, we want it to be robust to state estimation errors because the perception systems are not perfect. In fact, if you are taking images as input, we want the system to be robust to task irrelevant features in the, in the images or maybe in the sensor inputs. If there are, if these models are Trojans, which means that somebody has um, trained this with and, and injected uh, uh, Trojans in the ne neural networks, or maybe it's, uh, just by the way that they're trained, they end up having spurious features, and then you want the system to be robust to those as well. Um, so we've actually uh, uh, studied uh, most of these problems and, uh, and, and make uh, significant uh, headways in some of those. Uh, so here's the well-known adversarial uh, perturbation of adversarial example. Um, uh, a uh, scenario where it's tiny perturbations in the input is actually going to change the prediction of the model, in this case, from a panda to a gibbon, uh, just to show the significance of these types of works, right? These papers, uh, since they have been published in 2013 and 2014, they've been cited many times, lots of attention from the community. Uh, so what we've actually done is that we have a novel, novel technique to verify a local robustness, which means that robust, robustness on individual uh, inputs and we also have a way to train systems that have certified local robustness and that achieve uh, state-of-the-art results. And more recently, we are able to extend some of those techniques to do uh, post-deployment repairs, so essentially modifying a pre-trained neural network such that it would satisfy global robustness properties. Um, so that's just one aspect of robustness. You could also have a, a, a system that is for instance, maliciously trained or trained in some specific way, such that it will respond to this yellow sticker in the image. So this is known like, as the Trojan trigger. So whenever this trigger pattern is present in the inputs, the output of the model is always given. Um, and, and this is known, uh, known vulnerabilities, uh, and there are large endeavors, uh, such as the uh, IR Patrol JI project that where multiple teams are looking at these problems. Uh, and we've actually developed also attacks and defense techniques uh, for this problem as well. Um, and, uh, and these work might be also familiar to the audience. So this is looking at neural network control systems. So this is a closed loop control systems where the controller is a neural network. And we want these to be robust to, for instance, uncertainties in the initial state, or maybe also state estimation error as the system executes, right? So that we don't end up with the situations where uh, the drone ends up, you know, colliding with uh, with uh, power lines. Um, so we've uh, a series of works that actually tackle this problem, uh, specifically looking at uh, reachability analysis or safety verification of neural network control systems. And I'm going to argue that our latest work achieved that uh, the state of the art efficiency and tightness of uh, reachability analysis. And, and uh, hopefully, the, the next few two slides is not comprehensive, but the next two slides is going to hopefully will convince you that uh, we, we do a very good uh, reachability analysis uh, on actually many benchmarks. So here are two different examples. This rectangle that you see corresponds to uh, reachable sets. So we are trying interested in all the states that the system can reach, starting from some initial set of states. Um, and the different colors correspond to the different uh, reachable sets that are produced by different tools and the red trajectories correspond to simulations. 
So if you want to have very tight analysis, you want your rectangles or sequence of these rectangles to actually uh, closely encapsulate the red trajectories. And you can see that we can do that actually uh, uh, very well uh, for these examples. These are just visualizing the reachable set analysis. Uh, we also do it on many other benchmarks and compare also with many other tools. Um, and I think across these benchmarks and tools, uh, Polar is actually uh, much faster, uh, really precise in terms of the reachability analysis and can work with different types of activation functions. Um, and uh, the last notion of robustness that I'm going to talk about today is actually trying to be robust to irrelevant information in the input. So here we have an image of a panda, the model predicts panda, but what if you change the background to sky, right? So you don't want the model to predict stock, for instance. So in some sense, I'm arguing that the background information is actually task irrelevant. Uh, so we have some recent work on leveraging the idea of multi-view information bottleneck um, and, and make it work for deep reinforcement learning. Um, so here's some experimental results. So nice animations that hopefully it, uh, um, that, um, that would impress you. So these are from the DeepMind controlled uh, suite and so you have the foreground robot. So that's actually what we want to control. Um, in the clean setting, there's a static background, but we also consider backgrounds where there are some really busy videos playing. So for instance, people arranging flowers or maybe other types of uh, natural videos. And you essentially want your DRL controllers to be robust to those background distractions, to those visual distractions. So we compare with, I think, 11 state-of-the-art methods or appears at the top uh, ML conferences. And we have uh, significant improvements uh, compared to, to those methods. So I'm not going to sort of go over the details of those um, on the DeepMind control suite. And also, we are, if we visualize these on the TSNG plots, essentially a way of uh, looking at the low, uh, low dimensional embedding. And we can see that uh, if we have images with identical foregrounds, they are going to map to this latent space with similar reward values. So that's why this essentially means that the representation or the latent representation that we construct, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's task relevant and it's able to discard these task irrelevant information. Um, also, we can also visualize these uh, using uh, spatial attention maps, and you can see that uh, they focus on the foreground robots and sort of ignore the background images. Um, okay, so uh, I want to conclude uh, my talk by obviously acknowledging the, the, uh, my students. I have the I know, fortune to work with really an amazing group of students. Casper, uh, who he, he led the work on um, the DBP uh, work that I presented uh, today. And then obviously other students contributed significantly to the other, uh, other works. Um, and uh, obviously I want to acknowledge the funding agencies as well. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop here to, uh, in the interest of time. Um, and answer any questions that you might have. Good. Thank you so much, uh, Wenshaw. This was very interesting and I think uh, you explained the problem really well that many of the, even the undergrads and the audience here could understand the first part. And then I think the second, the last part was just showed a really wide breadth of work and depth of work that you've covered. It's a very, very interesting work. Uh, so think, Thank you, Rahul. Yeah, I think if um, we have time for one quick question because we are actually running a little bit over time. There's a... Uh, Nothing then, uh, yeah, I think many in the audience uh, online at least uh, know you well and we can follow up. And uh, but thank you so much and I'll follow up with you one-on-one -on -one later. Oh, sure thing. Yeah, uh, I'm happy to answer questions offline as well. Yeah, let's give uh, Dr. Venchao Lee a hand. Yeah, thank you for attending my talk. Thank you, I hope to see you in person. So, yeah, me too. So I hope we get to see each other uh, uh, in, in conferences or maybe elsewhere. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.